Welcome back. Well, we've got Radha Sterling with us again. Radha, welcome. I'm calling you from, well, not sunny Dallas yet because it's still pitch dark. It's the middle of the night here. And for Seb, if you're watching, the earth is round. Otherwise, it would be just as light here as it is where Radha's sitting. How are you doing? And happy that you're in the great state of Texas. I'm sure you'll have a wonderful time and learn a lot. It's not a place I've been before. I can tell you three things. Mm -hmm. First of all, the people are really, really friendly. Uh, mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, it's really humid here. It's a sort of subtropical yes. environment. And I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got these bugs and creepy crawlies. And they said, watch <laughs> out for the snakes, which is scary. Oh, <laughs> and, and the third thing is the, the, the general public have a rather more peace-loving uh, mindset than you would expect whenever you watch international politics uh, being broadcast from Capitol Hill uh, mm -hmm. on state-sponsored media stations in the UK. You've been to America, though, rather, haven't you? Uh, I am actually American, yes. I was I was born there and I've lived in California for a couple of years. I go there regularly, uh, usually to Washington, D.C., but um, Texas has always been on my list of places to go. And I think, yeah, it's it's interesting that you say they're peace loving because perhaps that's not the perception people have of Texans with their guns and, you know, cowboys and everything. But they are, you know, quite diplomatic and, and they don't want a lot of trouble. And that's possibly why they love their guns so much, because they see that as a preventative. I went walking after the show yesterday. It was mid morning and I was there's this massive lake probably about 150 meters that way and I tried to get down to it and I went through what seemed to be somebody's garden in the end when I came back to uh, where I'm staying I mentioned to one of the people who run the place what I had done I said is that a public through but he's no sir that's uh I can't do Texas accent no sir <laughs> that's a garden I said well I hope they don't mind I said well you could have got shot <laughs> and, <laughs> and he, he, he meant it he didn't really he wasn't threatening me he just said well you could have got shot that's what we no, do just around here. matter of fact yes yeah <laughs> shoot the guy yeah, so guy probably... in the suit in your garden <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't you know who I am? Ah, <laughs> there we go. Exactly. Um, so I'll probably skip the walking uh, experience uh, <laughs> today. Uh, but I'm very, very fond of the people here. Interestingly, you yourself say that you're American born, which also entitles you to stand for president of the United States. Oh, yes, I've considered it. <laughs> I, I think with all of the drama going on in America, though, that would be quite an endeavor. <laughs> Yes, uh, I would say so as well. Uh, later mm -hmm. on in the show, I'm going to speak to uh, a Texan born and bred, mm -hmm. uh, Teresa Jones, and she was mm -hmm. a chaperone uh, last night mm -hmm. to me. We went to this lovely riverside area, and it seems to me, to misquote uh, the sting, the singer, uh, the Americans, the Texans love their children too. Uh, mm -hmm. He sang a song about Russians loving their children. Mm -hmm. uh, what I notice when I travel is people are pretty much want the same thing all over the yes. world. They yes. want peace. They want Peace, food, stability. They want, mm. Yeah, they want love, if, mm. intimacy. They want love if they can get it. Yeah. And mm. some people want to have children. And mm. kind of after that, it's about it, uh, really. There's a guy called Maslow. I often quote him, Maslow's hierarchy of need. And he describes what motivates us. And I think it's the same everywhere. And the people in Texas, they want the same thing. And, and it's Absolutely. interesting. They've got much bigger cars. Just, I've been <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 one of the people who... Uh, who, who's helping me here? He's driving me around. She's driving me around in a 5.6 liter V8 engine car. Mm. Amazing. And um, I said, Don't you have any concerns about the size of your Parking. vehicle? She went, no, no, she went, No, no, I think it's, she said, I think it's big enough. I mean, mm. yeah, I was thinking about it the yeah. other way around. It's virtually a bus, madam. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, you just wouldn't see that kind of thing going around London, would you? <laughs> You couldn't park it, and, no, and Tariq Khan would, would yeah, Tariq Khan would brand you an enemy of the state. And I'll probably talk <laughs> about that a bit later on. Certainly. Uh, turning to you, I really found our conversation interesting the other day. Let's, for those who didn't hear or see it, tell us a little bit about yourself, Ferrado, please. Uh, I'm a crisis manager, founder of uh, Due Process International, that assists uh, people in various. Uh, difficult situations all over the world uh, that can be facing persecution by America, by Middle Eastern states, or uh, in in some very unusual situations, sometimes life or death. 
and that uh, that means that as part of what we do we deal regularly with politicians that can be for example you're in texas at the moment so we uh, worked with senator ted cruz on some of our cases and uh, he was extremely helpful and other congress people in in that state and all of the states in america so it, it just gives us a sort of overview it gives us an interaction with politicians um and we get that insight into what inspires them to you know assist us to reach our goals which is ultimately to help usually a particular individual in that difficult situation uh, how successful after the break we'll talk about a couple of specific issues but how successful do you feel you can be in a world where and here's my opinion uh, self-interest often usurps the public interest I mean, the thing is, if you're trying to help an individual, that's much easier. Obviously, you can just find what's also going to reflectively help that politician achieve, you know, it might be good publicity, it might be helping a constituent or, or similar. Um, but I think the overall issues are probably the most difficult ones, and that's uh, the issues of, of censorship and free speech and the suppression of information, um, the progression, you know, the new way that governments are trying to do things such as um, censor, you know, in the first instance, if we have a complaint about a new idea, whether it's a COVID vaccine or similar, suppressing anyone who questions or opposes that. And then later in, in two years time, usually is seems to be the, the average time it takes for the press, for the media to catch on and for the general public to start really seeing that, okay, we shouldn't have just automatically believed what we were spoon fed by the press and by the government. And but then by the time two years is up, there seem to be very little consequences for whatever action has been taken that has negatively impacted the public. And, you know, a great example is obviously COVID. But I think we see that with the suppression of information when it comes to wartime as well, all the way back to Iraq. And of course, before that, too. And most recently, with everything that's been going on in Russia, Ukraine, there's a lot of information that we are just denied by the government. And then we have this push to go in directions that we don't necessarily want to go in. That could be um, taking on refugees. It could be um, uh, becoming a cashless society, I think. And with the development of artificial intelligence and further surveillance by the government of the people without that accountability, I think there's so many issues that we really need to be talking about, need to be debating and need to be uh, installing more checks and balances on the government and the legislators and the, the organisations that have that power over us. So I guess that's the issue that I'm seeing more and more is rather than focusing on these individual cases, focusing on more of these issues. And I guess it, it's great to see that I think more and more voices are coming to that platform. More and more people are becoming more popular with their views and more people are asking those questions. Yeah, after the break, I want to explore, if it's okay with your particular question, which is partly sponsored by the fact that I'm here in the United States, which claims to be the land of the free. I learned that you can actually get fined if you don't cut your grass enough, yeah. where I'm living, up staying at the moment. Yes. The place looks like Stepford. Uh, if you've seen the film The Stepford Wives, yes. everything <laughs> is perfect. I kind of feel it's a cross between that and the Truman Show. And it's, I mean, not criticizing it. It's absolutely perfect. It makes me feel like I'm living in a slum, even though I live <laughs> in a rather leafy Surrey, which is a posh part of the outskirts of London. Yeah. Uh, and so after the break, I want to talk about, and it's quite a philosophical question, but what do you consider to be the nature of free speech and, and what should be our rights as global citizens? Uh, and the reason I'm asking that question is because people here are, are free-minded and really openly saying their variance to what is done in their name internationally by America. But there are also these other strictures. And how do you, how do you, how do you give people freedom if you're frightened of what they think when they're, they're allowed to speak freely? <laughs> and this seems to be a malaise that's just developing in, in the world at the moment. That's what I think. Uh, we'll come back to Rada in just a minute. If you've got calls and comments, then I will read them out. Mr. Moose, it looks like that. I'm not sleeping. I'm reading. All right. Got it, Mr. Moose. Uh, I'll check what you've been up to during the break. Uh, we'll come back to uh, Rada and see what she has to say about free speech as well. Wide awake and with you. This is Lemba Topic on today's News Talk. See you in a minute. TNT's Chris Smith. The never-ending drama surrounding the Bruce Lehman 
versus Channel 10 defamation case. Now, we've had some doozy allegations in the last 24 hours. You may have caught up with this. Allegations that Seven, the channel, paid for illicit drugs and prostitutes while they were trying to convince Learman to give an exclusive story to the channel. Now, in a previous life, I spent a significant number of years chasing very important and high-profile people who everyone wanted to speak with or hear from. And we did a lot of dastardly things to try and secure those exclusive interviews. But I have never paid for illicit drugs and prostitutes. Wow. Chris Smith on today's News Talk TNT. A better business tip from TNT Radio. One reason people tune in to TNT Radio is often because they're loyal to a specific show or personality. Our personalities have been a part of people's daily routine, and people continue to tune in. They trust TNT Radio and are highly engaged with the content. If you'd like more information about advertising on TNT Radio, simply fill out your details on our contact page, and we'll be in touch. To find out more, go to tntradio.live. CO2 sustains all life on Earth, but now it's in long-term decline. We face the return of an ice age. We mandate that the truth be told. Today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Greetings. Welcome back to the Lemotopic Show, brought to you live from our outside broadcasting studios in Dallas, Texas, USA. Uh, the song remains the same, though. If you want to make comments, then go to the tntradio.live website, or you can find our phone numbers wherever you are in the world, whether you're just around the corner from me in Texas or around the other side of the world from me in, at the moment, the United Kingdom. You're most welcome to have your say. The time goes very quickly, so apologies if I don't get to your call or comment. Uh, we do get deep and heavy into our discussions. Uh, the upside of it is, of course, uh, that you do see this live and unedited. That is what free speech is all about. That's what I'm discussing with my current guest. Uh, that's Rada Sterling, who's made something of a career out of uh, defending rights and freedoms all over the world. Uh, Rada, I wanted to speak slightly philosophically with you. And uh, it's an open question, but what would you say? And I want to do this just for the context. I'm trying to explore the extent to which free speech is genuinely being suppressed. My mm -hmm. opinion is that it is. And I, my opinion is that technology, which should actually open up dialogue, has been used to shut us down, especially now that apparently some of the big companies are using AI, artificial intelligence, to shut down other AI. But it could shut down a person. So I'm wondering, in big picture terms, what would you consider to have been your greatest triumph and your greatest frustration in terms of your campaigning for liberty and, and human rights? Yes. Um, I mean, for a long, long time, I personally and my organisation criticised countries like the UAE, where journalists are uh, absolutely suppressed, where everything they write goes through a government, you know, filtration where they check everything off and allow it to be published where journalists are going to be locked up for publishing something that is adversarial to the government or embarrassing or you know whatever it is unless it's favorable that that person actually risks their freedom and of course that's significant um there there are also laws there whereby if you whatsapp someone privately it could you could be your spouse it could be your flatmate and you say something rude to them, that's also against the law. And if they report you to the police, you will be arrested and prosecuted for that. Um, so there, there's quite extreme limitations on free speech in countries like the UAE, Saudi, Qatar. Um, but then you see that more and more happening in the United Kingdom. I think that the United Kingdom is actually has terrible um, freedom of expression provisions whereby people can be uh, prosecuted, they can be arrested, they can be deplatformed. Where you had, I mean, for example, I think mo most recent probably high profile case of that is the Russell Brand, where you had, you know, political figures actually writing to social media platforms and asking them to demonetize him. I think that's extreme. Then if we look at the United States, and I, I start questioning myself um, on, you know, having criticized, being a great critic of Middle Eastern countries for this reason. And then looking at what's what's been going on in the United States as well with suppression of free speech, with um, what the uh, Democrat Party was doing with regards to Facebook and other social media platforms suppressing um, 
you know, things that weren't beneficial to their, basically, their, their election campaign and calling it disinformation, then employing these bodies, creating these new authority bodies that determine what is mm -hmm. disinformation and what is information, and that actually having a ramification. But then you have people also being prosecuted and locked up for that. And you even have, mm -hmm. um, for example, there was a British gentleman, Christopher Ems, he went to a cryptocurrency conference in Pyongyang and did not violate any British laws, international laws or United Nations provisions. And yet the United States said this was against their law because it's a violation of um, their personal requirements. So you see them sort of exporting their own, I, I would say, using misusing their laws to cause censorship, including, you know, we spoke about Julian Assange last week, and of course that's a great example mm. of the US exporting their laws beyond their borders via Interpol, which is supposed to be a neutral um, international body. But when all of the countries who are members can misuse that, you end up seeing a lot of people listed with an Interpol red notice for journalism, for um, you know, essentially exercising their United Nation right to uh, freedom of expression. I think a good example, one of the cases I've been working on recently is that of Tara Reid. I don't know whether you've heard of her, but she was working for Senator Biden and she made sexual assault allegations against him around about two years ago. And then she has basically had to flee the United States um, for fear of persecution because, and um, they so in, instructed a grand jury to uh, gain all of her tw Twitter and social media profiles and, and bank accounts and all sorts of things. So you can see they, they wouldn't have an interest in her at all, except that they were weaponizing that censorship um, sort of beast, which, which is uh, news outlets working with intelligence agencies and social media agencies in order to defeat um, and, you know, cancel uh, adversaries, essentially. So these are really important things. I mean, if, if you wanted to get into the nitty gritty, which I don't, th you know, I don't think we're even there to get into this, but a lot of people are worried that, oh, if we don't censor information carefully if we don't have all of these organizations looking at hate speech and and disinformation people are going to be vulnerable to seeing hate speech or seeing disinformation well i think that at this stage it is more important that we get that information because there is such a push against depriving us of the information that we require to make decisions and to uh, protest or lobby or or change our voting um, protocols or you know favoured parties procedures. If we don't have that information, we can't make those decisions. We're absolutely controlled. And I would rather that we might be exposed to a little bit of hate speech and a little bit of um, uh, disinformation um, than be babied. We don't need to be babied. I, I definitely don't think we need to live in, live in a nanny state. We see examples of a nanny state and we criticise them. We criticise China with their social uh, point systems. We criticise all sorts of regimes, as we call them, for that sort of oppressive government behaviour. And yet we're pushing more and more in line to do that to our own citizens. So I think that that's probably the most important push at the moment. I was pretty happy yep. to see Elon Musk take over Twitter at the time because I think it was just a monopoly of censorship and and primarily coming from one particular political party permeating the entire world. Um, you eloquently describe the, in my view, the assault on free speech that we're all experiencing. Once again, that's an opinion, but it's one I feel quite strongly. I've been cancelled for various reasons and I very rarely trust the reason I'm given. I tend to assume it's a different reason that they won't share. And I don't even understand why people do that. If somebody doesn't want me to be on because of my views, they should say so. But I suspect there's a degree of shame in it. I suspect they recognize this isn't really how they should be working. We talked about Julian Assange, and he's a very public mm -hmm. case. But you've listed a series of less well-known, at least in the United Kingdom, cases where the same thing has happened because the individuals have either been out of order in the eyes of the state or speaking in convenient truths. Um, this po point about technology, 
has it made it harder or easier or is it not a factor in terms of the extent to which we're controlled and censored because after all if you say too much maybe your phone could be cut off for example I think it's more worrying, although right now and for the past few years, we've been able to gain a lot more information and hear a lot more voices. You know, they they haven't had to go through mainstream media. They haven't had to work extremely hard to get their points of view out. But there is that issue that if they get too big or they get too inconvenient to certain powers, they they have the ability to absolutely remove that voice, remove their income let's face it the more and more dependent we become on technology and and companies whether it's uh, zoom whether it's youtube whether it's twitter you know um, to get our message out the more vulnerable we are to control because as soon as we get just that little bit too big we can either be completely deplatformed we can have our bank accounts closed down we can be a persona non gratis essentially on the internet and they do have the monopoly to achieve that and i think that's also another issue and reason why um tiktok is seen as a threat because okay maybe they're less able to control tiktok to that extent or other platforms coming from other countries so there is that push where they do want to have everything under the one umbrella under this conglomerate of control and that is of great risk to us uh, i think we saw it during covid in particular on on facebook people started questioning whether the virus did in fact come from a, a wet market or whether it came from the Wuhan lab and they were kicked off Facebook for various amounts of time, sometimes having their uh, accounts permanently deleted or being uh, branded an antagonist, a conspiracy theorist and someone not to be trusted. It, and that kind of cancel culture at the time, which is a form of censorship, can ruin people's businesses, can ruin their livelihood, can ostracize them from a community. So when you have all of those powers, and I think the politicians essentially using these platforms to achieve those results. We leave ourselves extremely vulnerable to, to future control. And I think we need to really keep our, our governments in checks. And I think this should be possibly one of the most important issues when it comes to voting. And I would like to see more politicians out there, perhaps even more parties, because I'm quite tired of, of just two parties and them all voting for the same legislation, all supporting these legislations that we have not been as people consulted on. Yes, this, this convergence on these fundamental issues bothers me, rather. I got involved in politics, not because of economic policy. I think governments wreck economies. I don't think they very often help them. Mm -hmm. But because of libertarian issues, it seems to me that a government can actually quite profoundly affect your liberty uh, in terms of freedom of expression, how you live your life. And on top of that, we've now got this new malaise where the government tells us what freedom looks like. You've got to be tolerant about transsexual politics and LGBTQI and so on. You have to be understanding about a whole bunch of things that define whether you're a good person or not. But if you, for example, have fundamentalist religious beliefs, then you are pariahed, with one exception. If you have a fundamentalist religious belief in climate emergency, then you're allowed to talk about that, even though it's, in my view, scientifically illiterate to believe that. What I'm worried about now is do-gooding politicians who don't really have the depth to do their job, certainly compared to when I started out in the 1980s. These do-gooding politicians now tell us what's acceptable. I'm hoping we might be able to get a, a, a lawyer on later to talk about this situation in Scotland in the north of the British Isles, where they're now setting themselves up as the judge and jury for what you're allowed to say and what's offensive with a list of defended or protected characteristics. I, I wonder if this is the foothill of totalitarianism. I mean, it's it's truly outrageous. I know already in England there were issues around, you know, I think a good example is probably Tommy Robinson as far as, you know, suppression of his free speech and uh, how that might have escalated. But these new Scottish laws, although quite reflective of what might already be um, how the law is being weaponised even by the uh, judicial system, 
I, I just think it's absolutely outrageous that the UK would go that far because, you know, I've always seen the United Kingdom as focused on, on human rights, definitely, of um, freedom of expression, of a free society, and that British people are generally polite people and respectful, but it becomes absurd when they are being told what they're allowed to believe, what they're allowed to say, how their children should be raised, what they should be raised to believe, what schools are allowed to, um, well, you know, the, the extended influence that schools are having on them rather than teaching them to be critical thinkers they're teaching them to uh, abide by what the society well what that particular teacher or that particular school's personal views are and i i just think that's outrageous i know in america they're already starting to advertise universities on the basis of you know the kind of personal values that they have so if you come to this university don't worry we're not going to ram this sort of wokeness down your throats but the issue is most parents don't get a, a choice. They're, they're allocated a school and they have to go there. And I think that it's it's truly outrageous. I, I hope that the Scottish people challenge it, that this isn't the last we'll hear of it, that it does get overturned, that when, when we see test cases go through, that precedent will be set to protect people further in the long run. But this legislation should never have been passed. Uh, the past it was, and uh, later on I want to come back to talking about, uh, in terms of your work, how we can fix these these issues. Indeed, after the break, uh, I'm going to give you the freedom to redefine society. If you were in charge, how would you manage <laughs> the balance between free speech, offence and harm? I'll share my views too, but I want to start with yours. You're listening to Lembotopic here on the Lembotopic Show. Uh, I will get to your comments a little bit later on, uh, folks. Uh, I'm just really wanting to get the most from Rada. It's a fascinating dialogue we're having. Uh, do get involved. Uh, I will get back to your comments as well. Uh, I'll do it just after the top of the hour, I would expect. Uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you very much for, for the comments you're making about free speech. And you can make them here. You will not get censored on my show. Uh, this is the Lembotopic Show. This is TNT. We'll see you in a minute. Military families often sacrifice precious time away from loved ones while serving our country. And for those with children, the separation can be especially difficult. We were worried that with him leaving, that she would lose those connections with her dad. Some of life's best moments happen between parents, children, and the pages of a good book. United Through Reading provides that connection. You can watch your mom or dad read a book to you, and it almost feels like they're really there. We ensure they remain a consistent, meaningful part of their children's lives, no matter the distance. Just seeing Jacob recognize daddy again after a long time just melted my heart. And now, as we're facing greater isolation from our loved ones, United Through Reading is also available to veterans. Learn more about United Through Reading and download our free secure app at unitedthroughreading.org. The impact of a meal goes well beyond feeding our bodies. Because when people are fed, futures are nourished. Everyone deserves to live a full life. And with your help, together we can end hunger. Join the movement at feedingamerica.org slash act now. This is the Limbit Opic Show on today's News Talk TNT Radio. I'm with Radha Sterling, and for the next 15 minutes, Radha, you're the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. What do you change first? Absolutely be more uh, consultation with the public on issues that uh, involve them, and that would be pretty much everything. So I think it wouldn't hurt the government to be doing regular polls. I know that they've, they've done a few polls recently in Ireland, but they haven't taken the results of those polls into account and actually acted on them. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be a referendum, but I think if the government consistently consulted the public, do you want to send another 70 billion to Ukraine or whatever it is? And if the results came back overwhelmingly, no, then perhaps the government should rethink that as a tactic. If 
They believe that it's in the country's greatest benefit to send that money to Ukraine. Well, perhaps they should try to convince the public by by doing regular debates, you know, almost like presidential debates. Let's get all the politicians up there in front of live television and try to convince them why we should send that 70 billion to Ukraine. And at the end of it, let's do another poll. Um, how does it work? Okay, it's still the same. The public does not want to send that money. Then perhaps there's a good reason for that. Obviously, they've lost against other leading voices who have persuaded the public that it's not in their best interest to keep funding a war that could lead to uh, a nuclear attack. So I think absolutely more interactivity with the public, and that means educating the public better. Um, also, I think, you know, for example, sending less money to causes like this would also give that money needed to uh, put back into the community. That means, you know, re reducing homelessness, eliminating homelessness, um, all the complaints about the NHS having not enough money. Well, why did we send so much money to a private pharmaceutical American-owned company? that wasn't necessary at all. So if if we stopped funneling money offshore, mostly for the benefits of the, you know, the politicians who are being lobbied by uh, corporations who want to, you know, essentially make money and control their politicians, uh, then we would have the money left over to create that productive society, that that society that's not, you know, suffering from over too, too much crime and uh, lack of enforcement of, of existing laws. And then, of course, you know, being more of a libertarian, I would want people to have that, again, freedom to participate in the democratic process, freedom to debate, freedom to share uh, opinions without that fear of cancellation, and certainly that freedom to hold money however they like, whether it's, you know, Bitcoin cash without, you know, the government looking at ways to clamp down on that freedom. I think ultimately, if we're all happy, and we're all, you know, working in that productive situation. We're all participating. As you said, generally, when you speak to people, they all want the same thing, don't they? Security and 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 love and um, safety and happiness, I think. And so ultimately, they would drive towards that given the opportunity. And I think it's just certain uh, vested well, interest groups that are causing that problem. Uh, OK, uh, what would you say to those who say you're an idealist? And it's not realistic. Um, I would say those people are most likely to be employed by a corporation who is looking to make money out of the next crisis because crises are profitable. Uh, but self-interest has always been in politics. Why is it worse now? I think self-interest is less likely to be there if we had a more democratic and openly debated platform where citizens could participate more and where we could talk. And I mean, for example, I went to a meeting in London, a conservative meeting in, in Windsor, actually, and um, the, the local MP said, OK, I assume everyone in this room wants us to send a lot of money to Ukraine. And I thought, wow, he did not even ask the members of the Conservative Party who meet up on a regular basis. It was just absolutely rammed down their throats. Where is the consultation there? Uh, so I, I do think that, um, yes, of course, there's always going to be personal vested interests. There's always going to be vested interests. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but I think it's when we have extremely powerful multinational corporations and certainly uh, many of them international and, um, I mean, we have, for example, the United Arab Emirates owning Thames Water. We have, you know, China also investing significantly into our, our properties. So I would look at that, that foreign investment and the selling off of UK assets to foreign entities, which is essentially also selling our income. Um, so certainly we'd have to have a rethink about that. But I think also that would be covered if we had that public democratic um, participation on a regular basis because they would be more aware of these issues and they would be requesting and voting for those issues to be taken care of in a particular way. What's your assessment of the relative mindset of the Labour Party and the Conservatives? One of them will form the government in one form or another in Britain. Is there any difference? If you were to give your perspective on those two parties, are there any reasons to be cheerful? 
I mean, uh, very, very much like the UK, uh, sorry, like the United States, Australia and most other countries. I think we do have that issue that at the end of the day, most of these parties, there might, there might be some very, very important issues to people. For example, I think in America, you're going to be looking at the illegals coming over the southern border and uh, the economy. So you're going to look at it from that point of view. And then other people might vote on sort of broad strokes, human rights or climate change and, and that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, it doesn't seem to matter really who you vote for on the bigger issues of censorship, on on government clamping down on actual, you know, the rights to exist uh, in a sort of libertarian society, the right to participate democratically. Both parties in each of those Western nations, as examples, are still uh, looking to oppress citizens. And I think that's probably the biggest issue that we need to deal with. You know, you look at the Conservatives, you look at... Uh, at, at their at the liberals and you see that yes they all want to send money to ukraine they all want to um provoke a war with with russia it's very it's very unusual and that's why i think trump was quite a phenomenon because he was an individual rather than a party and it would be good to see i think perhaps more individual leaders coming forward to help enlighten uh, us on on issues that these two parties are simply trying to work out amongst themselves rather than consult with the public. And I think having, you know, third parties, having really popular and powerful individuals also brings that that sort of discussion to the table. The difference between Rishi Sunak's leadership and Sergei Starmer's. If you were to advise either of those party leaders, how to change direction without losing face, what would you tell them? Uh, I mean, ne neither of them are heading in the right direction as far as I'm concerned. Um, Rishi Sunak from, from day one made, you know, various promises that never came into fruition. Ultimately, I find that uh, Rishi, like most before him, essentially do fall to the the powers that that would be america that would be their leadership and being told how to interact whether it's with nato COVID, you know anything they are beholden to the united states at this point and there's very little care about the citizens of the united kingdom i can't imagine why rishi sunak has not been able to deal with the rising crime rates in london the fact that you know, Americans and, and Middle Easterns uh, especially think that it's completely unsafe to come to London. And perhaps they're right in many, many areas. And even in, you know, as you said, whether it's mobile phones, whether it's stabbings, it could be anywhere. I don't see why the United Kingdom is able to, you know, um, brave meeting with other, other leaders while they have these issues going on, yet while still funneling zillions off to, you know, whatever endeavour they, they deem at that purpose point. I think that Rishi Sunak really, um, it, it will be nice when we actually get to democratically elect a prime minister in the future. And frankly, I would, I hope, you know, that one day that person will not just be party oriented, will be an outsider, will be someone who cares about the future of the country and not just lining their pockets for the next four to eight years. Um, as far as, as you know, taxation is concerned, I think a lot of people get sucked in that, oh, okay, we're going to rise taxes, we're going to reduce taxes, and this is going to be great. When has it ever actually really helped that much? Do we still have homeless people? Are we still siphoning off billions to this cause or that cause? You know, it seems to be mostly talk. We're going to have crime. The NHS is, is going to be underfunded. We're going to sell off our resources, sell off our, our utility companies. And in the long run, you know, our children are entering a world that is becoming harder and harder to function from a young age, harder for them just to um, live off the wages that they have, harder for them to obtain loans for real estate. The loans are getting higher. The interest is getting more. I think that uh, society is becoming more difficult. And I think that it really does require that, inter you know, a new leader, a new party uh, or more participation of the public in the decision making. Well, here's my challenge to you then. 
you do this outstanding work and you're a great guest because I always find myself aligned with what you're saying, uh, which isn't a good reason to have people on just because I happen to agree with them. It's but, nice. Though. <laughs> but, uh, it, it is reassuring. I felt very much out in the cold for a long time as a member of parliament because I actually felt when I was an MP, I said, oh, you can't say that. Why not? Why can't we legalise all drugs? Oh, no, no, you can't say that. And then 10 years later, Canada does. Yeah. And it seems that I was ahead of the curve. So it is nice to be with a fellow traveller. But here's, here's the big challenge. I can't see much difference between Sunak and Starmer. I think it would actually be quite charitable, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we've now got a political class that doesn't understand the things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. They don't take freedom seriously because they come from an entitled background. No one can pretend that Sunak or Starmer have ever lived on the breadline. No one can pretend that they actually suffer the just about managing mm -hmm. dilemma uh, of whether you buy the bread or you buy a pot noodle or whatever it happens to be. Is it possible that you have a responsibility to stand for parliament? <laughs> um, it, it's quite possible and it, it, it's something that I have considered and will continue to. I think... Um, I, I think, yes, definitely. And as you say, you know, you can feel quite isolated to having these points of view. And luckily, more and more people are kind of coming forward and sharing these alternative, or not, not even alternative, in my opinion, these are just normal sort of mainstream views that have been suppressed by a government who's looking to create a crisis in people's heads to get votes. So mm -hmm. I think this whole, you know, dispute has been generated by political interests. I think before that, it would be quite easy to have a conversation with someone over dinner who had completely different views. And it didn't result in cancellation. It resulted in an interesting conversation, an interesting debate. So absolutely, yes, you're right here. Yeah, I think um, more and more people with these views need to get out there and not be afraid of, of that cancellation, not be afraid of having to deal with you know these these political figures out there and perhaps it is their responsibility to expose them for what they are as well i don't think that one needs to have suffered in life to understand the suffering of the average person i do agree that people like rishi sunak um is not necessarily going to understand what it feels like to be in that position but you don't need to have been through it to have empathy and to see that it's wrong you just walk down the street and see the homeless people and if you don't have empathy, then I don't think that you should even be in that position. If you don't genuinely care, uh, you either never cared or something's happened along the way where you've just prioritised mm. your own interests over everything else. And I think no one should be in a position of leading citizens if they don't have that empathy uh, to be able to understand what everyone's going through. And that can be the people struggling at the very low end, and it can be the entrepreneurs, you know, and even the millionaires who are looking to grow and create businesses that ultimately give employment. Um, so I think that you need to have a, a broad range of empathy. You can't just say tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich, you know, co company owners without the ramifications of, okay, they might leave the country and go uh, offshore or they might, you know, relocate to a more friendly jurisdiction like Texas, for example. Um, so I think <laughs> <laughs> so I think you do have to have the appreciation of all spectrums, so all levels of, of income and um and help them all as much as possible. And certainly neither one of the, the candidates for the next election have that at all. That's my problem. Uh, everything else you said there was quite optimistic until uh, your last sentence, rather. <laughs> I agree with you. I, I can't see who can run this country with the heart and the soul that mm. we're looking for, which means as they used to say when I was demonstrating in the 1980s, one solution, revolution. But it doesn't tend to work either very often, certainly not in the UK. In Britain, people go, well, I don't think that's very nice, but we'll, we'll keep calm and carry on. <laughs> and uh, I, I just wonder if the British and perhaps the Western acceptance of authority means that by the time we turn around to realise our freedom's gone, it's too late. And <clears throat> we'll be living in 15-minute cities. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll only be allowed to fly if you're a multi-billionaire with your private jet to tell people not to fly. And mm -hmm. so we end up in this horrendous dystopian world where the rich get more powerful and the yes. poor get locked into their homes. As Oxford, a city mm -hmm. in Britain, is trying to do, Mm -hmm. I understand they're actually talking about having climate lockdowns, even though there is no climate crisis. Where does this end? Mm 